Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today, I think I've got what is a really interesting look at how cores and cache can impact gaming performance. Now, you've no doubt heard someone at some point telling you that for gaming, you need X amount of cores, whether it be six is more than enough, or you need a minimum of eight due to some misguided notion that consoles have eight cores, and therefore that is what PC gamers will require moving forward. Now I've addressed these core misconceptions before, explaining that it's really all about overall CPU performance rather than how many cores a CPU has. And while that should be a fairly easy concept to understand, there has been a surprising amount of pushback. To be fair though, it is quite a complex subject as today's games require a certain level of processing power that can really only be achieved with a minimum of four cores. And therefore, this is partly why gamers tend to focus so much on core count. In many ways, it is very easy to dumb down system requirements to core count, as it's a quick and easy way to dismiss a wide range of CPUs. For example, games no longer run correctly, or potentially at all, on dual core CPUs. So in that sense, you require at minimum a quad core to game. Having said that, most modern and demanding games don't run that well on quad cores, even if they support simultaneous multi-threading technology. So it sounds very much like I'm saying gamers require at least six cores, basically contradicting my own argument right off the bat. But really, as I've said, it's more about overall CPU performance. So for example, there isn't a single quad core CPU in existence that can match the overall performance of a modern six core 12 thread processor, such as the Core i5-11600K or Ryzen 5 5600X. Inversely, there's dozens of CPUs with eight or more cores that can't match the gaming or even the overall CPU performance of the Core i5-11600K and Ryzen 5 5600X. Even parts as modern as the eight core 16 thread Ryzen 7 2700X are, and always will be, inferior for gaming and by some margin. We know this because the 5600X is over 10% faster than the 2700X when all cores are fully utilized in a productivity benchmark such as Cinebench. So couple that with the far superior core and memory latency of the 5600X and you have a six core CPU that will always be much better for gaming. So you see, dumbing down the argument to games require eight cores is a gross oversimplification and it can mislead PC builders, encouraging them to spend more on their CPU than they really need to, and quite often that money is better invested in a faster graphics card or simply saved for a future upgrade. It can also encourage them to purchase what is ultimately a much slower CPU for gaming. Think the 2700X over the 5600X. Now, something I've noticed and found quite interesting while benchmarking dozens of modern AMD and Intel CPUs in a wide range of games is the fact that Intel CPUs do appear to scale quite consistently in terms of performance as you add more cores, right up to 10 cores in fact, and that's despite games not requiring that much processing power. Then on the other hand, AMD Zen 3 range offers very consistent performance from six cores right up to 16, and in fact, very few games show any difference in performance. Looking at our Zen 3 CPU slash GPU scaling data, we see that with the almighty powerful GeForce RTX 3090 installed, the 16 core 32 thread Ryzen 9 5950X was on average just 5% faster than the six core 12 thread 5600X, while the eight core 16 thread 5800X was just 3% faster. Now you might claim something like a GPU bottleneck, despite the fact that this data is based on 1080p testing, but many of those games are very CPU intensive, even by today's standards. Now what I find quite interesting is if we take a similar range of games and then test them at 1080p with an RTX 3090, but we use Intel 10th gen CPUs, we find something quite different. The eight core 16 thread Core i7-10700K is 9% faster than the Core i5-10600K, while the 10900K is 16% faster, and that is quite a substantial performance uplift. And again, using the same data, the 5800X was just 3% faster than the 5600X, and the 5950X was just 4% faster. What makes this interesting is the fact that we've largely seen people justifying the more cores is better argument for gaming when using Intel CPUs. For example, claiming that their gaming experience was noticeably improved when upgrading from a part like the Core i7-8700K to the Core i9-10900K, and therefore attributed that solely to the 67% increase in core count, but is there more to it? Quite simply, the answer is yes. 
Now, the Zen 3 CPUs all feature 32 megabytes of L3 cache per CCD. So 32 megabytes total cache in the case of the Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 parts, with the Ryzen 9 models getting a total of 64 megabytes, which is broken into two separate dies. The Intel CPUs though see a fundamental change in L3 cache capacity depending on the core count. For example, the 10th gen 6 core i5 models get 12 megabytes of L3, then the 8 core i7s get 16 megabytes, and then the 10 core i9s 20 megabytes. So from the 10600K to the 10900K, you're not only receiving 67% more cores, but also a 67% increase in L3 cache capacity. Now, with most games still unable to max out all six cores of the 10600K, I wonder what's playing a more significant role here, the extra cache or the cores? And the really cool thing is we can actually find out by disabling cores on the 10700K and 10900K while locking the operating frequency, ring bus, and memory timings in place. And for this testing, I used the Gigabyte Z590 Aorus Extreme motherboard. I then clocked all three CPUs at 4.5 GHz with a 45 times multiplier for the ring bus and used DDR4-3200CL14 dual rank dual channel memory with all the primary, secondary and tertiary timings manually configured. Therefore, the only difference between each configuration is the core count and the L3 cache capacity, which is set in stone with each model. I should also note that disabling cores does not reduce the L3 pool size. So even with a single core enabled, the 10900K still has 20 megabytes of L3. Finally, all testing was conducted using the Radeon RX 6900 XT, as it's currently the fastest 1080p gaming graphics card. Also, please note, I hadn't actually planned on making a video based on this testing, it was just something that I did out of interest. So I've only tested six games, and while more would have certainly been better, this does give us a pretty good idea of what's going on here. So let's check out the results. Now I'm going to start with the most extreme example we have from the six game sample and please note that I didn't test a bunch of games to find these results. I just picked six games that I'm regularly testing with and I thought would make for an interesting investigation and some are certainly more CPU intensive than others, but that's kind of the idea. What we have here are the Rainbow Six Siege results, essentially comparing the 10600K, 10700K and 10900K with the only real alteration being the fact that they're all clocked at the same 4.5 GHz frequency, so it's basically an IPC test. The conclusion that most would draw from this is that going from 6 to 8 cores nets you 15% more performance, at least in this game, and from 8 to 10 is worth another 9%. So going from the 10600K to the 10900K will net you 25% more performance. And well, that is certainly true, but is this due to those four extra cores? Well, here's the eight core data comparing the 16 megabyte L3 cache to the 20 megabyte L3 cache. And as you can see, this alone allowed for a 5% increase in performance. And quite interestingly, the two extra cores only boosted performance by 3%. But the 10700K and 10900K were already quite close in terms of performance, so how does this look with just six cores enabled? This data is extremely interesting, and it looks a lot like what we see with AMD's Zen 3 processors. Now remember, the 10700K with all eight cores enabled is 15% faster than the 10600K in this test, going from 429 FPS to 494 FPS. But here we can see that 10% of that margin is due to the larger L3 cache capacity, going from 12 megabytes to 16 megabytes. So if the 10600K was equipped with the same 20 megabyte L3 cache as the 10900K, it would be faster than a stock 10700K. And perhaps more amazing is the fact that the 10900K was just 6% fast with all 10 cores enabled, opposed to just 6. So here we're looking at a situation where the 67% increase in cores nets you just 6% more performance, while the 67% increase in L3 cache nets you 18% more performance, making the extra cache far more useful in this scenario. It also proves my earlier point that it's not all about cores, though in this scenario we're testing CPUs of the same architecture, so more cores will always be as good or better, but if they all featured the same L3 cache capacity like what we see with the Zen 3 processors, for the vast majority of gamers there would be little benefit going beyond 6 cores. Now, for games that aren't very CPU intensive and therefore run just fine using any modern processor with six or more cores, adding more cores and or cache makes no difference as you're entirely GPU limited. And truth be told, this is the situation for the majority of games, even those released in the last year. 
Also, bear in mind that we're testing with a GeForce RTX 3090 at 1080p. So if you're gaming at a higher resolution, such as 1440p, with a lesser GPU, such as the RTX 3060 Ti or RX 6700 XT, then even in more CPU demanding games, the margins are likely to be similar to what is shown here. Watch Dogs Legion is another game that doesn't really require more CPU power than what you get with a Core i5-10600K. The extra cores and cache of the 10900K only net you 7% more performance at 1080p. That said, here it looks like the cache only results in about a 2.5% performance increase and the cores about 4%, but either way the difference overall is negligible. The Cyberpunk 2077 data is quite interesting, especially the 1% low results. We see a 15% improvement in 1% low performance when going from the 10600K to the 10900K, and this affects frame time performance. However, the bulk of that, basically all of it in fact, is due to the increased L3 cache capacity, with the extra cores doing basically nothing here. F1 2020 is another game where the bulk of the gains can be attributed to the increased L3 cache capacity. For example, the 10900K is seen to be 10% faster than the 10600K when matched clock for clock. However, if we limit the 10900K to just 6 cores, it almost didn't drop in performance when compared to its stock 10 core configuration. We're looking at a 1% margin. So this is another title where L3 cache capacity is more important than core count, at least when going beyond 6 with a modern architecture. Last up we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and the village section of the game that we use for testing is extremely CPU demanding, and on that note please be aware that I'm not using the built-in benchmark, we're actually playing the game. I always like to use Shadow of the Tomb Raider for any CPU testing, as it is very core heavy and will spread the load over many cores. And these are the most balanced results we've seen between adding more cores and more cache, as both appear to have a very positive impact on performance. At the same clock speed, we see that the 10900K is 18% faster than the 10600K when looking at the average frame rate, and a massive 32% faster for the 1% low result. That's quite a dramatic improvement, so let's focus on the 1% low performance. We see that 16% of the gain can be attributed to the increased cache capacity, with 14% coming from the added cores. So the gains here are fairly even between the cores and cache, and combined they add up to quite a significant performance improvement. That is, if you're playing at 1080p, using an RTX 3090, and trying to drive as many frames as possible. So there you have it, a look at how cores and cache influence the gaming performance of Intel's 10th gen core series. So, if you'd upgraded from something like a Core i7-8700K, which is essentially a Core i5-10600K, to something like a Core i7-10700K, or you know, even the 10900K, and you've noticed a reasonable uptick in performance, well, the chances are, in most instances, it's not actually due to those extra cores, but rather the extra cache. Of course, both do help, and ideally you'd like more of both, but when it comes to Intel processors, you simply can't pick which you'd prefer more of. I guess that's kind of a general rule anyway, as more cores mean more cash. But if you could, the smart investment might be cash. And it seems like AMD's come to a similar conclusion with the upcoming vCache technology. But of course, that is a story for a future benchmark. As we just saw when CPU limited in today's games, cache generally provides the largest performance gains, and this is why we see less of a performance variation between the various AMD Zen 3 based processors ranging from 6 to 16 cores. All of that said, you can't simply compare the cache capacity of different CPU architectures to determine which is better, just as you can't do the same with cores, as cache latency, bandwidth, and the way it's used does vary. But this does further prove why claiming that games require or are best served by 8-core processors is just wrong. There's far more to CPU performance than just the core count. The core design and stuff around the cores is extremely important, so evaluate CPUs based on their resulting performance rather than a paper spec. I have to admit, I've always found the CPU core misconception quite puzzling, but recently Tim explained to me what he thinks has been going on, and it might help explain the issue. Tim believes it's down to a fundamental misunderstanding regarding how CPUs work, believing people who push the games require X amount of cores nonsense are assuming a few things. Firstly, they might be incorrectly assuming that CPU cores are assigned a task, and can only process that task. Kind of like the CPU core partitioning we see in consoles, where for example one core is reserved for the operating system. But that's not the case with PCs, the cores are dynamic, meaning an individual core can be processing information for several different applications almost simultaneously without an issue. 
Tim also explained that he thinks this misconception stems from people believing that when a game says it works with or utilizes eight cores, that means the game loads up eight threads and then forces one thread to each core for the best performance. Then if there aren't enough cores to fit the eight threads, that will result in performance issues. However, that's also wrong. This isn't how it works, and in most instances, games that do scale well across eight cores work better with not just eight, but also six core processors, as the load is spread evenly across all available cores, meaning no one core is maxed out, as maxing out a single core would risk stalling the processing pipeline, and at that point, issues like stuttering are introduced when gaming. So this would only become a problem for a six core processor if all six cores were maxed out, so 100% utilized. Short of 100% utilization though, stuff like background tasks aren't generally an issue as the CPU can very easily handle those. And although context switching does incur a performance penalty, if the CPU cores are already faster to begin with, take the Ryzen 5 5600X versus the Ryzen 7 2700X for example, then this becomes somewhat of a non-issue. Now when it comes to buying advice, you are really best off working out what it is that you'll be doing with your computer, as in my opinion, there is no one set rule that is best for everyone. And you can say that for a lot of things when it comes to computers, everyone uses theirs differently. And I know people like to say you should buy this or you should do that, but it really comes down to what you're after as to what will work best for you. For example, are you going to be streaming gameplay and will you be using the CPU for the heavy lifting? Uh, will you be running heavy background tasks? Are you seeking high frame rates, which force a more CPU limited gaming experience? Or are you quite conservative with what you run in the background, just leaving lightweight applications open, such as Discord and Steam, for example? If you know you'll be running core heavy applications while gaming, which I believe is a bit odd, but if you are, more cores for a given CPU architecture will help. But again, parts like the Ryzen 7 2700X won't be better than the Ryzen 5 5600X, Rather, the 5800X would be better than the 5600X. Again, remember, it's all about overall CPU performance. However, if you're just gaming with typical background tasks, a CPU of comparable power and performance to the Ryzen 5 5600X is really going to be overkill, and more than capable of extracting the most out of extreme GPUs using competitive quality settings in today's most demanding games. So rather than dump a little over 40% more money into your CPU, which is exactly what you'd be doing if you opted for the 5800X over the 5600X, you'd be better off spending that money elsewhere or just saving it for a future upgrade. The more cores slash planning for the future thing really only makes sense if you're talking about CPUs occupying the same price point. For example, if the Ryzen 5 5600X and Core i9 10900K were the same price, I'd certainly strongly advocate for going with the Intel processor, as in that scenario you'd be receiving comparable gaming performance now, with the chance of much better performance in the future, given the 10900K is around 45% faster overall when maxed out. But in reality, the Core i9 10900K is priced at $540 US, making it almost 90% more expensive than the Ryzen 5 5600X, and purely for gaming that makes it a horrible investment. Anyway, that in my opinion was an interesting look at how much cores and L3 cache influence the performance of Intel CPUs, and hopefully the discussion surrounding the whole CPU core cap thing was useful for those of you looking at buying or upgrading your CPU. And that is really going to do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like, you can subscribe for more content, and if you'd like to become a Hardware Unbox community member, then you can join us over at Patreon or Floatplane. You will get access to some exclusive stuff like a monthly live stream with Tim and myself, Q&A stuff, uh, behind the scenes content, and of course our exclusive Discord server. Very awesome community over there. So if you're interested, links are in the video description. If not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.